is having, you know, some real open honest conversations in relation to our Caribbean African community. So we're going to hear from some of our clinicians. Then the plan is to go into breakout rooms if need be, you know, so that people can, ha- you know, have the opportunity to share their views. If we're not massive in numbers, then we can, you know, have have the conversations here. So Dr. Ngozi, we're going to make a start with you. You are a clinician on the front line you know, for you to give us some observations and reflections. Good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us. So what is relatively short notice, but what we felt was um, an important um, event to host. So my name is Ngozi Ediasage. I'm a paediatrician and I work in central Manchester at St. Mary's Hospital. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, We felt it was important because things are changing. We know that there's still quite a number of people who are not vaccinated. We know that um, there are a number of people that have major concerns about what's been happening. Um, We also know that the whole life course of this pandemic has been one that has um, left us with a lot of uncertainties, a lot of concerns and worries. And this is what it is. It's a listening event, really. And it's a listening event so that we can listen to your concerns and answer them in the best way that we can. As a clinician, I remain really, really convinced that the only way out of this pandemic is for us to be vaccinated. And the reasons for that are whilst this Omicron variant has come and sort of given us a sort of sideways swipe, if you if you like. um, Now, I'll be honest with you. Everything that we do is is um, learning from day to day about what's been been happening and taking that in the best way possible. But the vaccine programme is the only way out of this. So what we want to do today is to listen to concerns, listen to your questions, answer them if we can. Um, and um, that, that's where I'm going to leave it. I think before I go, what I will say is that being a frontline clinician, I've said this many times, I'm in a position of relative privilege because I can see the effects of not being vaccinated. So I am a neonatologist, which means I look after premature babies. And currently, um, the vast majority of pregnant women who come in and have concerns and are ill with COVID are those who haven't been vaccinated. And we can understand some of the reasons for this. At the beginning, there wasn't enough known about the vaccine for the government to come out and give a um, incontrovertible message about the need to vaccinate um, pregnant women. And that's changed. And unfortunately, I think because of the original concerns, that message has not kept up. People have not kept up with that message. However, being in, in, in frontline medicine, I can see the effects. So it's easy for me to have the vaccine, have confidence in the vaccine, but I understand why for some of you it isn't. But this is what it is, it's a listening event. So please keep your questions coming. Um, We will try and as much as possible to uh, discuss things. It's an open meeting, but you know, the overriding um, message is to to try and get vaccinated. So I'm going to hand back to Charles now. Thanks, Dr. Ngozi. I think we're now gonna hand over to Dr. Vanessa Pia, who is a consultant in sexual health. Thanks so much, and um, good evening, everyone. Um, uh, it's great to be here. And um, so, as um, Charles said, I'm Vanessa Rapier. I'm a consultant in sexual health and HIV. And um, through this pandemic, a lot of my work has been working with all our communities to really raise awareness about COVID and uh, protecting ourselves. And then when the vaccine came out, really to get the information out there to make sure that everyone had access to good, trusted information to make their decision. Um, And I think um, 
it feels right um, that we're meeting tonight. It's It was put together really quickly. So a lot of respect to Khan and thank you. Um, but it feels right because I think we, we all know we've, we're in this pandemic, things can be ever changing, but there has been a real shift in the last, you know, it's only a few weeks, but it feels like a, another lifetime. Um, and, but what it's raised again is that for me, definitely, and I think many of us on the call, but just the importance of vaccines and the importance of ensuring that people have the right information about vaccines. Um, I think, um, as um, Dr Ngozi said, there's a, there is a privilege of working in the NHS, working in the front line, because you do see the impact of COVID um, firsthand. And many people say to me that, you know, do I feel comfortable as a black woman, as a black doctor, going out and advocating for vaccines in our communities? Yes, I feel I'm, I feel very um, comfortable and confident to do that because every day what I see in my work is that the impact of COVID itself far outweighs anything that we can think about with the vaccine. Um, and I really understand and relate um, that we are in a time of uncertainty. And the thing is that we're, we're constantly learning together and we're constantly trusting science together. But again, I emphasize um, what has been said earlier is that I truly believe that vaccines are key to us coming going through this pandemic. I'm not going to say de coming out, um, definitely, you know, I can't give, we can't, we don't know any timescales, but moving through this pandemic safely, um, vaccines, I believe, are key to that. I, I believe that vaccines are part of our armory. We've got, we've got our masks, we've got social distancing, um, we've got washing our hands, we've got keeping the rooms ventilated, but vaccines can make such a dent in the COVID experience. And so, but I think that it's events like these that are so important for us to share our experiences, um, get the education out there, but also think about solutions. Cause I'm sure there's many people on the call here that have been fully vaccinated, have had their booster and are thinking, how do we support our wider community? And so I think another part of tonight is sharing ideas. What can we do to support our communities to make sure that we don't bear the brunt of this next wave? I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Great, Th thanks for that, Dr. Vanessa. So I think Dr. Bola is delayed in joining us, but you know, we can get into the discussion whilst we, you know, wait for others to join. So we've put in three questions, as you saw on the poster, you know, wanting to understand, you know, what do we need to do to build trust? What are some of the community concerns and what steps do we need to take? Apologies for the title in order to, you know, increase the uptake of the vaccine. So, you know, so who is going to kick us off? So welcome to those who have just joined us. We've had opening reflections and thoughts, observations from Dr. Ngozi and Dr. Vanessa. And at the moment, we're looking at three questions in the chat box. What do we need to do to build trust? What are some of the community concerns you're hearing? And what steps do we need to take to increase uptake of the vaccine? So I'll make a start, but one of the things that we can do to um, perhaps build trust is events like this. And I think it's really powerful when you have people that you you may trust. And, uh, you know, we've during our health hour, many of you will have seen me week in, week out, um, invite black doctors. And I think it's important that it is black doctors, people that you, you know, your friends and relatives that you've had around your dinner table, that over the years you've gone to chat to when you've been to your GP and the GP tells you something that you're not quite sure about, 
you've gone to your doctor friends and family and you've trusted us over the years so we're asking you to continue to put that that trust in us uh, during this period um now i think it's really important as well in terms of building trust is if you recall almost a year ago when the vaccines came out we ran an event that we had doctors who had had the vaccine because if there are they're misgivings about the vaccines now there were even more misgivings about them a year ago so one of the things that we do have is we have lots of experience about what's happened with the vaccines so we know that for the number of vaccines that have been given that they're safe we can incontrovertibly say that we've had millions of doses so no matter what the misgivings you have are we know that in general this is now incontrovertible a year later that they're safe so we 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 spoke, we chatted with you for most of you well quite a, lot, a number of people and i'm sure some of you here today were here um 11 months ago so we, we know that at least at that point we were we were um we were basing our decisions on the science and the evidence that we've been provided but now, 11 months later, I think that's one aspect that we can tick off. So if there are people here today saying that we are, um, you are still worried, um, then we'll have to, you know, we could chat to some of the people involved because at least that bit um, is, is sort of ticked off about the safety aspects of it. The other reason that um, when we say build trust, it's, um, making sure we have an environment where you can be honestly share your views because we don't want to have a situation where people feel um whilst you're providing message to have your vaccines we want people who have genuine concerns to come forward and voice them because if not if we cannot if we don't know what the concerns are that means we can't allay them and the, the possibility that you won't go you come forward to have your vaccines so even a year later i know that there's still concerns but but voice them so that we can address them. Um, and the third thing I'd say is that I know Charles and Faye have loads of experience in trying to um, build bridges and allay concerns because we've been having community events throughout the year. We've had vaccine pop-up clinics where people have come along um, to have vaccines and have been able to talk to doctors and Charles and Faye on a one-to-one -one basis. So I don't think there's any question that people raised today that we haven't heard before. So please put them in the chat, raise your hands. If, we, if you don't voice them, then we won't know how to, to do that. So I think from the, the first bit of it, we will, um, the first question, that's the suggestions I've put forward. And you've put in the chat that I'm a GP. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a GP, I'm a paediatrician. So I don't have general knowledge, just quite a lot of knowledge about children and a lot of faith in the vaccine. Yeah, th th thanks for that, Dr. Ngozi. I'm going to bring in Elizabeth, then James and then Laura. So Elizabeth Cameron. Hello? Hi. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Thank you. Thank you that you can hear me. OK, I'm just going to take the camera off for a second, if that's OK with you. So, look, I what I want to say is this. For some people, they I, I've, I've known so many people who've been really, really worried about this. And it seemed like at the beginning there was so much concern about, uh, you know, it was almost a conspiracy theory for there's something in it that's going to be tracing us, tracking us somehow. I was concerned about this idea that DNA was being captured against, you know, that potentially uh, black people and there would be this detrimental effect and I've got to tell you that I came from this at a point of I wanted to know facts before I was going to take those injections despite the fact that for me it's literally between life or death whether I would take those injections 
Um, I didn't have time to sort of mess about with yes or no or maybe. I have an autoimmune condition that means for me, the chance of getting COVID kind of means I wouldn't probably survive it. Um, I can't, I don't have the comfort that some people have got about whether they will or not based on some folklore. I had to deal with science. I had to deal with the science of it and what was the likelihoods of my survival. Because I have a family who wanted me to survive for whom they didn't think it was an option. And they were helping me decide, they were deciding for me. And nevertheless, I still check the science. I went on these REACH um, sort of evenings that they were having with the REACH Society and they had doctors week after week after week, looking at the science, suggesting what we might do, talking about whether or not there was any possibility that we could have gone through this onslaught that we've gone through without having to take in, uh, this, these injections. And for them, it was very clear that there was no alternative. This was our alternative. Our alternative was to take a medication that had was approved and it is approved and I took the first one I've got to tell you you know this isn't an advert for anything I took the first one I had no effects and impact whatsoever I took AstraZeneca because I've had also an anaphylactic reaction to various things in the past um one that's been unexplained so therefore AstraZeneca was deemed to be the one that I should take my second dosage, some months later, they carefully ensured that I had AstraZeneca. I've now had, it was about three weeks ago, the booster jab. And um, the booster, you know, I'm not going to lie, that had an impact on me. I was given the um, Pfizer one and told that the AstraZeneca booster hadn't been approved as yet and so I had no choice so I don't know if the impact that I had had like a headachey feeling my body was quite weary for a number of days and uh, so about four days in five days in I started to feel like my real self again but here's the thing I've been around people literally in a crowd of people where somebody has then been a co uh, diagnosed later with COVID and I've not had it. Um, I've taken, you know, I regularly take lateral flow to, to because I am in circumstances where I might be doing a speaking engagement. I don't want to put anybody else to risk. I've got an 86 year old mother. I cannot put her to risk. My, literally my family would never forgive me and I wouldn't forgive myself if she stays inside the house all the time and then contracted this. I have look after my daughter's pretty much newborn child. Well, from newborn age, I was looking after her. It wasn't a choice for me. I took the choice to protect other people. And for me, that meant taking the injection. And I'm here to say, it's been safe for me. I haven't had uh, any of the effects that people worried me about. Um, and, and that's all I can give as testimony. And I, I would be, I would want to tell the absolute truth with it, which is why I also told you about the booster and the impact that that did have on me. It wasn't, you know, wonderful. Um, but what is wonderful is that I'm here to tell the tale. Okay. So I don't know if that well, my story can change anything for anyone, but my daughter who has MS, she was in the same situation and she, like me, it's between life and death and that injection will keep you alive. You can still get COVID, yes you can, but you are likely to survive it. Thank you. Elizabeth, thanks for sharing your story and being really open and honest. I'm going to bring in James, Laura, and I think Bola has joined. So after we've taken, you know, James and Laura, we'll go to Bola. Charles, I'm happy to give way to Laura's question uh, Question first. I can save mine till, uh, till a little bit later. Okay, Laura, and then, yes. Okay, Laura. yeah. Can you hear me? 
Yeah, hi everyone. Yeah, so um, like Elizabeth was saying, you know, the, the vaccine is kind of like um, really important for, for people. So they have, you know, we work with um, vulnerable people as well in the charity. And then we've just been encouraging them to go for their booster dose. I think they, they most, they most of them have had their booster vaccines now. But there's just um, a kind of uh, mix, mix up there. They're like, they don't know if that's the third dose. I would like to check with the doctors on board if um, the booster dose is the same as the third dose, or would they be called later to get a third dose? Because that was like um, one uh, argument we, we had um, recently in one of our, our groups. And then um, I always use myself as an example, you know, like I had my, my second dose in um, July, I think it was, got my card here, it was 2nd July. And by 31st of August, I tested positive to COVID and I had symptoms. I had like blocked nose, you know, and everything, uh, high temperature and all. So I always use myself as an example to friends, family and everybody in the group, you know, the vaccine alone, the two doses, yeah, couldn't prevent me from, from catching the virus. So at the end of the day, if they're gonna offer us a booster dose, why not? And I was really willing, waiting for my turn to get the, the booster, um, those which I had um, earlier today. And then, yeah, so I think um, we just need to be encouraging our people, especially our black black community. You know, we saw how most of them you know, really got sick with the virus and and, and the, the death rates in our, in our group, you know, and uh, yeah, you just keep encouraging them. I know there was a lot of conspiracies and everything at the beginning. That's why people had that, um, uh, you know, dragging their feet, but all that is clear now. And people that have had the vaccines, they've not died from the vaccine. So I think, yeah, we just just keep talking to them using ourselves as examples. Those of us have had the vaccine, just keep using yourself as an example. I've had the vaccine, you know, what and what um, symptoms you had or effects you had. And of course, I have not heard of anybody that had the vaccine and died from the vaccine, you know? So yeah, I think that's what we just need to continue carry on doing. Thank you. Thanks, Laura, for sharing. I think I'll take memory and then, you know, we'll go to Bola. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi, memory. We can hear you. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, sorry. I, I just got in now. Um, I, I wasn't aware that the, I mean, there's a meeting tonight and Faye just sent me this and I thought, you know, I need to come and share just a little bit because I'm, I'm with the kids as well. So for me, uh, I'm a mental health nurse and um, I'm also into health and social care business where we support people, vulnerable individuals, and most of our staff are from the black um, ethnic minority, mainly black people. I would say 90% or 93% somewhere there. So personally, I had the vaccine, I had the Pfizer. Um, initially, I, I personally was a bit confused because of the, you know, the different theories which are coming up within our communities, especially on social media, because I'm, I'm from Zimbabwean community and um, we, we have like loads of, um, you know, like Facebook groups, like where women were about more than 12,000, only Zimbabwean women on that group and some WhatsApp groups as well. And people had so many theories, which were very scary, you know. So it, it actually took my husband to convince me, imagine me personally, I'm a, I'm a nurse, I should know better, right? But my husband had to convince me um, and say, you know what, you know, uh, this vaccine is not meant to kill anybody, but to protect us. Let's go with it. So he, I said, no, you go first. And he, he went and he, had, he, he took his vaccine. And then I followed a few days later. Uh, obviously, I had, you know, like expected symptoms, you know, like feeling, you know, fatigue and the pain around this you know, injection site. That was fine. Second dose was fine as well. But we, we had our booster, I would say it's almost two weeks now. Believe me, this was different, but it's Pfizer as well. Uh, but then the symptoms we had after that, like the pain, you know, like some agony, you know, I remember my husband was actually literally walking with one side. The pain was too much going under his armpits and we're wondering why. And I've heard a story as well that there's a, a, a nurse actually who said um, a second dose and ended up having neurological problems uh, at the moment. And it's, um, it's very scary. So if someone is now wheelchair bound 
and they are spreading, you know, the news that this is because of, of the vaccine, it affects, you know, our decision making, uh, I mean, in our communities. So I think uh, within our black communities, we need a lot, a lot of awareness, uh, because I still, I know that there's still a lot of people, even healthcare professionals, even people I work with, uh, despite that there is now new legislation that if someone is not vaccinated, cannot work in healthcare. But there are people who are adamant that no, they are not going to be forced and take this. But we need to encourage them and let them see the reasons why, because it's to protect us. Because Omicron, the way it's coming, and apparently researchers are talking about the resistance as well from the two current va vaccines. So I think um, this is a very good. Um, platform to be raising this awareness because uh, like uh, for my community a lot of people in healthcare they are nurses I remember we had a lot of uh, black nurses uh, Zimbabwe nurses dying uh, at the first wave of uh, during the peak of the COVID-19 I lost the nurses that I have worked with that I know who even from still being a student nurse one family lost mom dad and the daughter within the same week we had to even uh, come up with a COVID fund to support families uh, who are bereaved and who have lost their families uh, and also especially uh, individuals who are working as agents nurses they're at risk because they are forced to work on the uh, wards where there's COVID-19 patients and they've got no choice to choose because they you know they need to survive and apparently there are cases that they would go to work and they'll be moved to those wards so these are discussions I've heard from the nurses groups you know be, be being shared that you know what do we do if we are forced to go and work there if you don't you are reported and you never get shifts so they are putting themselves at risk at the same time that's when they are not making the right decision to get the vaccines so for me i advocate for vaccines and for the booster as well to keep ourselves safe i don't think the vaccine is intentionally to hurt anybody or if somebody actually get um I mean, uh, worst symptoms from it or any condition from it. I don't think it's it's intentional. I think we need to just push for our community to realize that uh, let's not <laughs> let's be safe than to be sorry. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks for that memory. So we're going to listen. We're going to hear from Dr. Bola Wolabi, you know, who is the director. She's a GP and also director of health inequalities uh, at NHS England, NHS Improvement. And then after that, all those questions that have come in the chat box, we will put them to our doctor. So I think Dr. Vanessa, there's one about, you know, collapse and, you know, fainting and, you know, Dr. Ngozi, there, there are others there that we will feel to you as well. But for now, Dr. Bola. Thank you so much, Charles. Good evening, everyone. Hello, Vanessa and Gozi. We meet again. <clears throat> it's been a very long, nearly two years now um, of this pandemic. Um, apologies joining you late. It's been rolling from one recording to, to the other one, but it's very important um, because we all need to be doing our very best, um, especially now. Look, I just want to share some reflections with you all and thank you so much to Memory who spoke just before me now um, for the reflections that you've just brought into the room. It's really important. And as Charles very kindly introduced, um, I'm a GP, um, but also um, I'm Director of Health Inequalities um, at NHS England and Improvement. And like many of you, I had hoped that this Christmas, uh, COVID won't be our focus. But the new variant, this Omicron variant, means that once again, we find ourselves at a, at a very crucial point um, in, in our fight, because that's really what it is in our fight um, against this pandemic. And whilst, you know, we may not have all the specific details on Omicron, uh, we didn't realize just how infectious it was going to be. But now we know. Now we know that it's far more infectious than any other variant of the COVID-19 virus um, that we've seen. That's what viruses do. They, they mutate, you know, and this was bound to happen. 
But, you know, this week we, we hit that record high of over 70,000 people in a single day testing positive. We, we haven't had that at any point in all of this pandemic. We've not seen that sort of number. That's the level of infectivity that this Omicron variant represents. And also we know from you know, the latest data that it's spreading at an incredible pace, you know, doubling every two to three days. And the risk now is that with this huge increase in infections, is going to be an increased risk of hospitalizations. And sadly, as memory was saying, this may well translate into even more fatalities than what we've seen before. And the thing that we all need to bear in mind is this, the virus will find the path of least resistance especially this new highly infectious variant. It will find the path of least resistance to spread. And that path of least resistance are the people and communities who are not vaccinated. And we know, you know, again, from the data that is um, coming through that at least getting the booster jab increases protection from Omicron. A booster jab gives you over 70% protection. We know now that even having had the two first doses aren't going to be sufficient protection from this new variant. And look, my call to all of us, we all know somebody who has lost friends or indeed family members to this pandemic. The thing to remember also is this, we're not where we were. At the beginning of this pandemic, go back to April last year, we had no defense, we had no answer. All we could do was lock down and shield and so on. But thankfully, because we now have this vaccine, we've not only saved lives, we've saved people's livelihoods. Many people have been able to go back to work because the, 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 the disaster of the COVID pandemic has not only been the loss of life and everything that means, but also the loss of livelihood. And so when we think about the vaccine, I want us to think very carefully about the fact that the vaccine is the reason why we were able to come out of lockdown. The vaccine is the reason why many people were able to go back to the jobs that they and their families depend on. So look, if you've had your second dose of the COVID 19 jab, perhaps three months ago or more, and you're aged over 18, you can book your booster now. And also just in the last day or so, the NHS has published walk-in centers where you can walk in and get your booster jab. And it's important to remember from a side effect point of view, it's very similar to, you, to the other doses that you've had. For most people, it's a sore so, arm. Um, you know, we, we know that there, there were more serious side effects. But when you compare the risk of the COVID-19 infection itself, and you balance that against the very rare risks of the side effects of the vaccines. I think the case is made that really the balance of risk <coughs> is still 
very much in favor of you having the vaccine. And for those who are still feeling hesitant after all this time, it may seem like yet again another vaccine. Let's not lose sight of the progress we've made. Look at the height of this pandemic before the vaccine rollout, we were losing over a thousand people a day. Just ponder those numbers for a moment. Over a thousand people a day to COVID before the vaccine rollout. And now we have the vaccines and it really is incumbent on us as the community that has borne the worst brunt of this pandemic already. It's incumbent on us now, you know, to take this evergreen offer. And it's not just about us as individuals, it's about our families, it's about our community. This is not the time to be complacent. This is not the time to say, look, I've had the two doses, it's fine. The evidence says those two doses are not sufficient protection against this variant. And the other thing that I would just like to say is in addition to taking the vaccines, there are other important things that we need to do. Simple things that are within our power to do. Mask wearing, you know, face masks when we're in public indoor venues, working from home as much as we can. You know, if we need to go into work, making sure that you're taking your lateral flow test regularly, again, to protect yourself, to protect the people that you're working with, making sure that where you are is ventilated, let the fresh air in. I know it's cold, but when you balance it again, when you're indoors, let the fresh air in. 10 minutes every hour. Wash your hands. And as we go into this Christmas season, there will be many, many more Christmases. And I know it feels very frustrating that here is another Christmas where we may not be able to do the things we hoped to be able to do. I had to cancel my team's um, Christmas get together this week. It made me really sad because many of them have never met in person. And I was really looking forward to this Christmas get together as the opportunity to bond, you know, as a team of people working together, but I've had to cancel it. We need to think about the bigger prize, the bigger prize of keeping ourselves, our families and our communities healthy. So I implore you, please get your vaccine. Please take all these simple measures. Together it will make a difference. And um, I wish you a happy Christmas and, and your families. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Bola, for those words. I think James has a question and then there are a couple of them will take in the chat box. So James, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, thanks, Charles. Uh, thanks to everybody for for coming on and uh, and taking the time uh, out of their evenings to uh, to speak today. It was really a question for Dr. Vanessa and Dr. Ngozi. I just wondered. I uh, put it in the chat box as well. I just wondered if you'd seen the nature of people's anxieties change over uh, over time about getting the uh, the vaccination. Obviously, at the start of the uh, at the start of the pandemic, is that the vaccination process? data and uh, stories and evidence around efficacy was, uh, wasn't was as, uh, as substantial as it is now. And I wondered whether that is, uh, in your experience, has changed over time. Thank you for, again for your, uh, for your time this evening. Um, thank you so much. Um, I have definitely seen a change. Um, and one thing I um, really want to say is that it is events like these um, where um, 
the communities have come together to make sure that the right information goes out to communities, I think have made all the difference. But there has been a change, you know, in the beginning when we were just amassing the data. And I, I say in anything, you have the early adopters who come in and that and take the data as is and there's others that over time want to learn more about the data and to feel more confident and I think as we got more data but then as we worked more with um, different community groups to get the information out there you could there was a definite palpable difference in people's anxieties being um, allayed and people taking up the vaccine but everything evolves people's emotions evolve um, as you go through the pandemic and um, there's um, pandemic fatigue um, and also now we've come into this next era and there's another injection and so people people's concerns and anxieties have risen up again and that's why I think it is so important that we do all talk together and get the information out there but I do think that um, events like this make a huge difference in, in allaying people's fears. Thanks, James, for the question. I think it's, I, I don't really have much to add to what Vanessa has said, but it, it definitely it has changed. Um, at the beginning, when we, we ran our listening event at the beginning of January, the questions were much more because people didn't know, people weren't aware of, of what could happen. Um, people were worried about a new vaccine. Um, there, was a, there was a vacuum of good information, which is not the same now. There's lots and lots of information. I, I've just checked in the UK, there's been 123 million vaccines, to individual doses given. So now there's, there's a lot more information now there will always be people, as, as um, Vanessa said, the early adopters, people who just go for it, and people who are still concerned. And the concerns we've seen some of them in the chat, one is about what they will feel is inconsistent information. So a year ago, we all felt that having the two, two doses were, and we'd be over this. But that's what science is. It evolves to deal with the situations as we see it. None of us thought we'd be in this situation um, a year later where we'd be looking at another booster. It, it was, if you listened carefully at the very beginning, there was a loose, they did allude to the fact that we may need regular boosters as we need for the flu because viruses mutate. That is the way that they evolve and need to survive like any other organ, organism. But we're really lucky that the science has also evolved as well to ensure that we can, we can do the best that we can do in a situation like this. And it's not just, as, as Bola said, it's not just about loss of life and loss of livelihood. The impact it's been having on children, the number of um, the missed opportunities in schools to form just normal relationships with friends, the incidence of mental health that has, um, that has just overrun so many young people um, in the last year. So it has changed. I know and I feel that more and more people are on board with the vaccines there will always be a subset of people who feel there's something about being in control. And I think people want to be in, a contr in control even when there is uncertainty and people are worried. And it almost feels that now that we're getting to a situation where we're mandating the vaccine for some, for some people, health workers, which I think is the right thing to do, it feels like a, a loss of that control for some people. Um, and that causes anxieties. But the, the one thing that we can say without um, glossing it over, without any controversial, is that it, it saves lives. If you look at all those graphs about deaths, it, it does save lives. And, and that's what we need to remind people of, people who are worried and concerned, it, it does save lives. Well, thanks for your question, James, thank you. Well, thank you for both of the answers. I think it's really interesting. It's so consistent, uh, so consistent, whether we're talking about children from our communities or talking about people that have lo experienced long term health conditions of various different types, that the, the message is consistent and uh, and true. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, both for the uh, for the answers. Really interesting. Thanks, James. I think I'm going to bring in Elizabeth and then Vanessa, I'll come to you about the questions of the fainting. And yeah, so Elizabeth and then we go to Vanessa. 
Thank you, Charles. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to come back in again. Look, I won't make any bones about this. I am in a position of influence as the chair of the GM race panel. I do. I get to be a spokesman about issues. I get to be somebody to whom people will decide one way or another uh, on, the, on the back of what I might say. And I take that position extremely seriously. What I saw and what I spoke on when the pandemic was at its height was the absolute disgrace of inequality that we face as black people in society right now. Yes, you've seen some very influential people tonight give you good information uh, about what I believe is an injection that ultimately has more chance of saving us than certainly doing harm to us. And even on that level, we should consider and, and seriously want to take it. But when I think about the inequalities that I've talked about, the ones that I've exposed, the ones that I've held decision makers to account on, the ones that I've helped create policy on the back of now in this short space of time, those things have not changed significantly enough for me to be comfortable that worse won't happen this time around. This new strain is so pernicious, so rife, so, so much more heightened than we ever even thought that COVID was at the times when we were concerned about it. And yet it's just been said tonight, memory said it, a mother, a sister, a brother. I've had five people, five people of my family group die during this period of time. I have never known that in a lifetime. I watched a new stories about black people, sadly, who weren't being given the priority of treatment as others. I watched nurses who I know tell me about situations they were facing at work and they aren't here now to tell the tale. And I'm not here to do some kind of, I don't know, uh, whistleblowing on the, on, on the NHS situations or health situations or care situations. I'm just suffice to say, I want those of us who are still here to survive. And if I'm in a position of influence, to the communities which we represent and that as around that table we've got Jewish we've got you know Asian South Asian Indian heritage people we have Chinese people uh, indigenous people Polish people um, you know a whole range of different backgrounds if I was a spokesman right now to them right now I am going to put my neck on the line, I'm prepared to do that and say, we need to be taking this injection. We need to be taking it so we can survive to change the situations for the rest of us who are here. We need to be here for our families because we have lost money, we have lost livelihoods, we have lost homes, we have lost those who we love and we shouldn't lose the rest of us. You're all precious to me. All those people I work with are precious to me. My family is precious to me. And I see that if there is a crowd of people who are likely to go in this round, it will be those of us who didn't take the injection of which the majority of us are black, sadly to say. So if I can influence anything tonight, and I have a responsibility as the chair of that GMCA race equality panel, I am here to say you should take the injection, really seriously consider it. And if there are reasons why you can't that need to be medically answered, these forums, this forum and forums like it, use them to help you change your mind. Please, thank you. Thank you, Charles. Th so thanks for that, Elizabeth. So we'll go to Vanessa and then I think Dr. Bula, there's a question about the third dose. And then, you know, I know Ngozi responded earlier on about, you know, the size. But, you know, I, I know people who have the first two and they are saying, oh, if we go for the third, they're going to say fourth, fifth. So after, you know, Dr. Vanessa has responded, I wonder if you want to come in and, and say a few words. Charles, could you please let me um, tell me the question? Because my chat isn't working for some reason. 
Okay. So I think we had someone asking about, you know, concerns about people who faint and, you know, the reactions to the vaccine. Uh, 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 okay. Um, I'll ask, um, I can answer um, in theory and then if, uh, if there's any specifics. I wonder if this is due to, um, I, I had a phone call yesterday um, from my um, nephew about um, vaccines and um, the footballers and some suggestions in the newspaper about fainting. So I don't know if it's all um, related, um, if that was in the question as well. Um, but um, uh, exactly what I said to um, um, my um, nephew and his friends. Um, so when we think about the, side, the, the most common side effects from the vaccines, um, what, what do we normally hear about? We hear about, you know, the painful arm, a bit of tiredness, sometimes a bit of flu-like sy symptoms, which generally settle after a few days. Um, some people take some paracetamol to, to ease those symptoms. And that, that is normally the, the most common type of side effects that you do get. Some people do experience um, fainting, um, and but I think what's really important is that not any side effect that anyone um, experiences, you know, we never want to dismiss it. And in fact, um, there is a reporting tool that you can go online. Um, it's the yellow card reporting um, system. And if there's any side effect that you feel that you've experienced, you can go on there or you can tell your doctor, your GP, and they can report it to, to to have that information there and th those side effects are regularly reviewed to make sure to see if there are any patterns or, or trends but with regards to the fainting we we sometimes see it with um vac uh, covid vaccines but we also see it with other vaccines as well and there's a number of causes for fainting and actually um often it can be triggered more from the actual um having the vaccine itself not the actual vaccine that any specific vaccine it's just the process of going for a vaccine, the nerves, the anxiety about it, and that can also trigger um, fainting as well. The, I, the concern that was, and there's some rumours circulating, I think some newspapers um, have talked about an association between um, the COVID-19 vaccine and then some foot, there's an increased number of footballers fainting and they were vaccinated. So then in the media, they talked about a link about it. So I've received some questions about that. And um, just to say again, um, it's really important that when you hear these things, do go and speak to trusted individuals to ask them. Don't sit there with um, the, the, that bit of knowledge and questioning it uh, and, ex sorry, accepting it. Um, because I think this is another um, uh, example of when um, the media has, and other parts of social media have um, used information falsely. And when you look at all the different footballers that have um, uh, fainted or had other heart conditions, it, some of them haven't been vaccinated, let me say, and some of them have been vaccinated, but the time gap between their symptoms is extremely large. And, you know, for most of them, there is there are many other reasons that may have caused um, their fainting or cardiac problems separate to the vaccine. So I think it's, again, it's a, another clear example of the power of media, but also the power, the importance of correcting this information and getting it out there. So we, we sometimes see fainting. Um, it's, um, we, it's not necessarily caused by the having the vaccine itself, just the process of it. And with, there is no increased association that we have seen with the footballers, any of their um, fainting or heart conditions and the COVID-19 vaccines. Thanks, Dr. Vanessa. Dr. Bola. And then, Dr. Ngozi, if you could get ready, yeah. there's a question about eating, you know, foods that can boost immunity. Thank you, Charles. I think on the question of um, why do we need yet another booster dose? Um, as Vanessa was saying there, right at the beginning of the pandemic, I think, or was it Dr. Vanessa or Dr. Ngozi? Somebody said it. We always said from the beginning that there is a likelihood that this virus may well behave like some other viruses that we already know, like the flu virus, whereby you need an annual injection because it mutates. 
So every year, the flu virus will mutate, which means that the flu vaccine has to be tweaked in order to be effective against the particular circulating um, variant in any particular year. We don't know where we're going to land with Omicron or with COVID-19 virus broadly yet. But what we do know is that it's behaving like other viruses in that it's mutating. And this current Omicron variant is able to get past the vaccine shield if you just have the two doses. But we're fortunate that the, the science is keeping up with the virus. That's the good news. You know, we're not in a position as we feared very early on, whether or not this virus has now managed to mutate into a version that is able to get past the vaccine shield completely. Fortunately, it hasn't managed to get past it completely, but the two doses we now know are not sufficient protection. I think it's about 40%. The protection drops to about 40%. Um, you know, against this variant. But by the time you get the booster dose, that then goes back up to 70% protection. So it's not as though there is anyone who just wants to keep giving people more and more vaccines. It's just that we have to continue to respond, you know, to, to the danger and the challenge that it presents. I mean, think about it in any of our of our lives, if I if I may, for a moment, just use a, just a regular non-scientific life example. If you happen to live in an area, let's say you started off thinking, well, it's a very safe area. There's no need really to be locking the doors or anything like that. It's fine. But then you get burgled, and then you sort out your lock systems and your alarm systems, and then if you're so unlucky that you get burgled again, then what do you do? You step up your security systems. That's what you do. And you keep doing it until you get to a place where you feel confident that actually within the realms of possibility, you have been responsible and done everything in your power to protect yourself. Think about the vaccines like that. You know, what would be irresponsible is for this new variant to appear and for us to just rock back as the health system, throw up our hands and say there is nothing we can do about it and hope for the best. Thankfully, we're not in that position. We're in a position where we have people working day and night in science labs, not only over, all over this country, all over the world, constantly following this virus, how it's changing, and doing what you and I will do if we were burgled, continuing to up the security systems. That's what the booster dose is doing. It's upping our immune response, our immune defense, because what we cannot allow is to simply accept that this variant is just going to come and just rip through the population. That, that no responsible health system anywhere in the world should allow that to happen. So I'm really imploring people to see the booster jab as us doing the responsible thing which is to continue to keep in lockstep with this virus and, if possible, to stay several paces in front of it in keeping, you know, our people and our communities safe. And it may be that as we go forward, as Dr. Ngozi was saying, we may end up in a position like the flu virus where the way to keep that immune response up is to have booster jabs every year. We don't know, but that could very well be the case. And if that is the case, you know, as um, my colleague who spoke earlier and very sadly has lost so many people in her family, as she was, as she said, I was struck by that statement. Let's not lose any more of us. I think we've lost enough people. 
um, way, way, way more than way more than we should have done. And this is the time, you know, to to put down um, those conspiracy theories and look at the science for its merit and do the right thing and protect ourselves and our community. Thank you, Charles. Thanks, Dr. Bula. I'm going to bring in Dr. Ngozi, but please use the chat box. We've had many of the, the concerns. We're now asking what steps must we take to increase the uptake of the vaccine and what do we need to do to build trust? So use the chat box. Dr. Ngozi is going to come in and then I'll bring in Mandy. Ten minutes to go. Thank you. Um, I think one of the, th the questions that was there was about um, boosting immunity through eating food. I, I can put that to bed very easily and 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 no, if if that was an option, knowing the concerns that we all have, we would have used that option. I think what we can't get away from, and I think I've seen this in the chat in a, in a number of different ways, is the inconsistencies about dealing with lockdowns, the um, information we've had about some people following the rules and not following the rules when they mandate it for everybody else. It doesn't help to engender um, positivity and doesn't help to engender trust in the people that are asking you to do things. I think we're really lucky to have Bola here today, who I know has a direct line to people who don't behave as much as they should do, and um, perhaps cause some of these concerns about inconsistent behavior and inconsistent messaging that allow people to lose trust. But I come back to the overriding thing that we absolutely know. We should listen to the scientists and sometimes not always the politicians, it's the scientists that we should listen to. And when you look at the data over and over again, it's so clear that vaccines help prevent death. You know, so that's the overriding message. So I think that we're, we're really lucky to have Bola here who's, um, here and talks about inequalities because one of the other things that we have data on is the inequalities in the outcomes that we've had because we haven't stepped forward to be vaccinated and that's just really sad and every week when we have our health hours the health hours that i think have so much more resonance is where we have somebody who comes with life experience so it's not just scientists and doctors sitting there saying this is what happened you have people who are there who say this happened to me, they're patient experts. And the story from Elizabeth, I sat there and I just thought how powerful that will be for some of you here, because these are people who have lost family members, friends, and mainly because they weren't jabbed. And the last thing I'll say about this is the number of stories of people who have come forward. So I, over the year, you think people would have vaccine fatigue in terms of the stories that are out there. But if you watch the news, I think on a regular basis, you have people who come on and say, I wish I'd had the jab. Because these are people who have been had really serious consequences of COVID and are now saying to themselves, if I'd known, if I'd listened, I would have had the vaccine and perhaps wouldn't have been in this position. So these are not sciences, these are people with lived experience who, are, who have gone through and are happy to share their story. Um, so, I, so I know that there will always be questions, but the overwhelming evidence is on the positive side for taking the vaccine. It is, it is now overwhelming. Um, and so, you know, your inner voice that is still that concern, just listen to the overwhelming evidence. So, so thank you. And th thank you for everybody that's here. Thanks, Dr. Ngozi. So I'm going to bring in Mandy and then Jennifer. But, you know, Annabelle, you've raised a point in the chat box about mandating, you know, and I know it's something that's an ongoing conversation, but also I think lots of data around vaccine on gov.uk. So just signposting. But also we're interested in doing a number of videos. There's a question in there about the influencers, those who can you know, help, you know, reach our community. So please keep the ideas coming in the chat box and we have an email there as well. So Mandy and then Jennifer. Right. Thanks very much. And I just want to congratulate uh, Khan for this um, uh, today's uh, talk. And thank you so much to our esteemed doctors, health 
uh, health professionals, as well as, uh, you know, uh, leaders and um, the communities that are, it's really uh, good that we are having all these conversations. For me in Bolton, because I have been right on the ground as um, a community member in my community, talking to the various, um, you know, <coughs> communities, churches, going into churches and that time, early on, you, when I went first to talk to the churches, nobody, there was no social distancing, they were not using masks, and most of it obviously was others couldn't afford, others couldn't, didn't think that it was really important to follow those. And um, when we started this conversation, I think Khan knows the difficulties we have been having here in Bolton in terms of getting heard. So when I've heard of the lady who spoke, sorry, and now I'm confusing myself. I think it's Elizabeth who says she sits on the ra race equality across Greater Manchester. And one of the issues we have in Bolton is not having our communities getting funding for all the COVID work that all the other communities were able to, and we were not. So information wasn't flowing to our communities even if where we wanted to have um, um, to have uh, the various languages in terms of the leaflets as well, in some of the most spoken languages in, you know, in Africa and so on. And it took us nearly nine months to get heard. So those are also the other conversations we need. Yes, there's also quite a lot of reluctance, but again, why is that reluctance? We need to have these conversations to say, is it because the information the, is the right information is not going to the community and this kind of information in what ways is it reaching and is it is it information that is indeed needed in that community and i find that unfortunately that is not happening because we are just talking from say a very um a very medical point but we need to be to go and to go under in the at the grassroots level what is it in terms of our information that will actually get to our community and that's where i have a lot of problems with the uh, agencies as well because that kind of information is not the information that is helping people right on the ground it's not in a format that is going to reach far or being understood. So that's what I wanted to also say that, yes, to me, I find it really hard because the reluctance is there. And one of the things here in Bolton, I don't know in Greater Manchester, it's also the, um, the religious community. If say your pastor hasn't got, hasn't been vaccinated, what about your flock? What are they going to do? So one of the things that I have experienced here in Bolton especially is also the reluctance in terms of our religious leaders to actually get vaccinated. And that in itself cascades to their worshippers or to their members of the various churches. Yeah, that's all. Thank you so much for listening to me and I appreciate every one of you for all your help that you are doing. And um, yeah, please let us work hard so that our community is safe. Thanks, Mandy. So I'm going to ask for people to give us another five minutes or so. We'll wrap up soon. So I'm going to bring in Jennifer and then Abdul will talk a bit about the data and some of the concerns that Annabelle has you know, brought up. And then we'll go back to our doctors for some closing remarks. But please, you know, send us your email. We want to do some videos and, and podcasts with you and further engagement. Over to you, Jennifer. Thank you so much, Charles, and thank you to the Sterling lineup. Um, you've been absolutely wonderful with what you have said this evening. I just quickly wanted to share a little bit about my experience. So I'm speaking from the West Midlands. I am a lead vaccination nurse. I certainly was one of the only ethnic minority lead nurses um, that I saw. And when we started vaccinations, certainly... Um, I did not see many people coming forward that looked like me. So a year ago, I started working with EDI leads to organize webinars for staff. 
And then it was quite clear that those staff members were not encouraging their family members to have the vaccine. So the sorts of things that you're doing, we have been doing in Birmingham as well. Um, we have got a webinar and um, the Chief Nursing Officer, um, Chief Midwifery, Midwifery Officer Strategic Advisory Group and the Midlands Lead. We've got a webinar on Monday talking about mandation. We've got a virologist and an immunologist. I will be speaking as well. Um, Abdul, who will be speaking next, has got the link in our um, group WhatsApp. But I want to just quickly talk about accessibility. So we set up these mass vaccination centre. I've been managing teams of staff. We've been vaccinating up to 2,000 a day. We've had mobile units, so we've vaccinated 50 a day. A lot of people from our community can't get to these mass vaccination centres. They, they can't afford taxis. They have to get on buses. It's cold. They're waiting in line. We have got to bring the vaccine closer to the community. And I know there's been a lot of initiatives to address that. But I think the leaders need to really think seriously about accessibility. I have worked with uh, church leaders, particularly from the Church of God of Prophecy and other um, faith leaders, community leaders, and we've brought the vaccine on church sites. We've gone out into the community. And do you know what worked? Actually walking around, talking to people in the town centres, in the deprived areas, face to face about the benefits and the risk of having the vaccine. I also am a reservist nurse. I work in intensive care one day a week. Last few weeks, the more times I go onto the units, there are more and more people that look like you and me. They are getting younger. We lost a 26 year old about three or four weeks ago. We have 45 and 50 year olds, some of them with underlying conditions, all of them unvaccinated. We have pregnant ladies unvaccinated. So what I just want to stress is, I don't want to lay anybody else out. That's I don't want to have to ring another family member. I don't want to have to ask somebody who is struggling to breathe to ring their family members to say, actually, the staff have decided that they need to be put to sleep, they need to be ventilated. We don't want to have to keep doing that. Accessibility is an issue. We also need face-to-face -face, um, focus groups these events are fantastic, but what has also worked is actually going out into the community, going out into the Afro-Caribbean centres. I've done a lot of that. All of this is done in my own time. I'm not getting funded for doing any of this work. If we could scale this up, there are more and more volunteers, individuals like me, who, like Elizabeth has said, we don't want to lose any more of our people. And accessibility is absolutely key for our people. The huge vaccination centres, fantastic but we've got to get the vaccine to the community. Intensive care is where you will end up if you do not get vaccinated. And that is the situation. And, you know, at the end of the day, we are in a country where the vaccine is free. In some countries, they're having to pay for oxygen and for the vaccine. So just really listen to the experts on this panel, those of you who are unvaccinated. Um, just really seriously think about the benefits versus the risks. Thank you, Charles, for giving me the opportunity. And I'll post the details of the event on Monday, or I will ask Abdul or Nicole to do that so that hopefully you will be able to attend. Thank you. Okay. F thanks, Vanessa, for uh, thanks, Jennifer, for sharing that. Dr. Vanessa, you have to go and speak to the Ghanaian community about <laughs> vaccination, so we will release you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for all your comments and sharing. Take care. Bye. Okay, great. So we'll go to Abdul, who responds to some of the queries about data, and then we will take some closing remarks. But please keep your comments coming and share your email. Over to you, Abdul. Thank you. Um, Charles, could you uh, unlock the sharing facility so I can just share maybe some couple of slides, if that's okay? So people will be able to see better. Um, one thing we do know is vaccination uptake amongst our underserved communities is continuing to be a, a major concern. It's the lowest when it comes to Black African, Black African Caribbean communities and lowest when it comes to Pakistani and Bangladeshi community. Um, so therefore, Black African Caribbean community work is one of our top priorities in the national team. And the data that I'm trying to share, which I can't for some reason, uh, what we have got 
<clears throat> for example, is the booster data is showing. Uh, I will try once more. No, I can't. So I'm just going to refer to my my screens. Uh, Elizabeth, so could you make Abdul what we are host. seeing? If you could, please, that would be really helpful. I think we will find it informative um, on being able to see some of the some of the graphs. I'll try sharing again. Host disabled attendee screen sharing. Sorry. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll keep, if, if once you've been able to uh, enable the function, just give me a heads up. Or, or Abdul, um, it might so be worth just speaking to the numbers. Of, yeah. Sorry, there's a slight delay. I'm saying yeah, that, that um, if the slides won't come up, it might be uh, worth just speaking to uh, the numbers because that's powerful too. Um, yeah, no, I'll do that. So in terms of the numbers, um, so I had this, I had some information that was done at the middle of November for another purpose. And then obviously when there was data question raised, I thought I'd share that with colleagues. In terms of the booster, as at 16th of November, our operational data was showing that it, for uh, people from uh, Black African, Black African Caribbean communities, they were the third and fourth lowest group in terms of vaccine uptake only the pakistani and bangladeshi community were worse off and at that time in november uh, just just around 50 percent abdul sorry to of, interrupt you co-host now so you can share oh perfect let's try again yep okay uh, Sorry, uh, can you see? Yes, we can. This slide. It says overall booster uptake. Yeah, that's it. We can see that now. Okay, so what you see here, this is this was in, obviously middle of November for another commission that I was working on, and what that was showing was the African Caribbean community uptake for the booster based on those people that were eligible at that time. So please know it was for those people that were eligible. The the Black Caribbean was just around 50%, and the Black African was just over 40%. The Pakistani and Bangladeshi community uptake was lower. And then if you look at some of the systems where we've got those areas with the highest areas with large Black African and Caribbean communities, what we were seeing was the, the following kind of pattern there in terms of uh, how the numbers were being uh, increased based on September, October, and November. So what you'll see, the, the last month of November obviously still was in progress. So that was beginning to show that we were seeing some progress. And then if I show you the 12 to 15 and the 16 to 17 year old update at the same time, the 16 to 17, the Black African and Black Caribbean community uptake is the lowest for those two groups, 16 to 17 year olds and 12 to 15 year olds. And you can see from the graph there, the difference at that time, obviously this was mid November between those communities and some of the rest of the communities. And what we find after Black African and Black Caribbean is the Pakistani and Bangladeshi. So those are the two uh, communities that we've got lowest uptake. And then just finally, uh, I'll just share this one. Apologies, it's a bit more detailed and that's, very recent, it was done for a deep dive I was preparing for today, which got cancelled. And what this is showing is that in terms of unvaccinated, i.e. those people that have not had their first dose yet, around 50% of those unvaccinated are white British. But when we look at the ethnic groups in terms of percentage, what we see is that the Black Caribbean and other Black ethnic groups have a higher percentage of the population that have not yet come forward to have their first dose. So that just shows we've got a, a problem with the first, or a challenge actually, with the first and second dose for adults, for 16 to 17 year olds, for 12 to 15 year olds, and we've also got an emerging challenge for the, uh, the booster dose that we've got. So obviously we are doing some more work. We are working very closely with Bola and, and colleagues, and we've got a number of proposals that will be coming 
through shortly reducing the process of confirming those and that would be aimed at doing some specific targeting in some of these systems that have got the largest number of uh, unvaccinated black African Caribbean communities and we're also hoping very soon that the Department of Level Open Communities and Homes will be uh, hopefully supporting the second phase of the Community Champions Programme and that will be looking to provide support for 60 areas. We're still waiting for some confirmation of that but we do know that the areas that they were considering are areas where we've got high numbers of people from back African Caribbean community, also high numbers from uh, Pakistani Bangladeshi community, and also high numbers of people from white British, white other that have not had their dose yet. So please bear with us. We are trying to respond as quickly as we can, but equally, we're really keen to see what more can be done by some of the amazing colleagues that have been on the call today. So uh, if that's okay, Charles, I'll hand back over to you. Okay, th thanks for that, Abdul. So I'm going to take James and then go to Dr. Bola, Dr. Ngozi, and then we will be wrapping up. Thanks, Abdul. I thought, uh, thanks, Charles, as well. I thought that's really interesting, interesting data. Uh, I mean, obviously, the, the, it, it points quite clearly to that we need to take very specific uh, approaches to, uh, to engaging people within our communities around uh, specific uh, demographies uh, as well. There's a very clear uh, uh, line uh, and evidence base to show around, you know, kind of young persons uh, update. So I think uh, young, uh, around reaching out and engaging with young people. And I think that speaks to a point that Faye put in, uh, in the chat uh, box there, that we need to try and think about innovative approaches in engaging people to, uh, to get vaccinated. From, an, uh, from as early a state, uh, age as, uh, as possible. And I think that evidence that you've shown, uh, Abdul, really, uh, you know, kind of backs up uh, and, uh, and advocates and testifies for that, uh, for that need for us to be able to work in those areas specifically. Thanks, James. I think as, as, we, as I bring in Dr. Bola, you know, there's a comment there about transparency, about the long-term effects. And I know you've made the point many times about the here and now and the real challenges, but also the fatalities. So, you know, as you wrap up, you know, if you can touch on that, that would be really helpful. Charles, is it okay? I think I think I should give, we should give Bola the, the final word. So if I, yeah. I say something, I think it would be nice for to have the, the, the final word. Um, what I was going to say, I just wanted to say thank you so much for Jennifer for sharing what she shared from the West Midlands. Um, we've, we, we do, what, what she's demonstrated is that if we as black health professionals go into black areas that we can actually even have more, even more reach than we're having now. Um, we've relied a lot on volunteers and voluntary organizations. I think it's time for the government to put their hands in their pocket really, because if we can see the demographics um, we know that in terms of equal, equality of opportunities and um, jobs, that we're much more likely to be in demographics where we don't earn as much. And yet we're relying again and again on this population um, volunteering to try and get people to come out. Um, you know, I, I think it's one of the areas that we, we haven't talked about as much about resources to really enable um, can to get um, volunteers to go out and do this. The fact that Jennifer's doing all this in her own time speaks volumes, even though that she's seen results as a, as a result of this. Um, so I think we're really lucky to have you again, <laughs> Bala, and I'll leave you to have the last word on what I think has been a really informative um, evening. So thank you once again for Can for putting it on, but over to you, Bala. Thank you so much, Ngozi and Charles and Vanessa, who's had to drop off the call, um, Jennifer, Elizabeth, so many people, Abdul, going way, way beyond, you know, still texting at 11 p.m. and and so on. I just want to say a personal thank you to you all. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, the point you've made is so important, Ngozi, and... Um, I'm so glad Abdul was able to join us. Um, he'll tell you the many, many conversations we've had, whether by chat or, or on the phone, around the issues of resourcing. 
Um, and I can assure you that we are working incredibly hard in the background to mobilize the funds, um, to make sure that we get the funds out um, in support of the organizations that are making such a huge difference at the front line. And we will continue to do that work. Also, just to pick up the point um, that Abdul was making in terms of the data, is that, you know, every single day now we're getting volunteers from church and other organizations wanting to be pop-up centers. Um, can I just encourage everyone on the call, if there are people in your network who are considering being pop-up centers, can you please drop Abdul and I an, e an email? Mm -hmm. We will work with you to try and make it happen. If you have suggestions about what else we can do, again, please put it in the chat box, share it with CAN, they will get it across to us. Um, you know, we, we are mobilizing very hard in the background um, to make sure that we divert our energies and our efforts um, at our communities who are not coming with us um, on this journey at quite the pace that we need them to come. And the thing that I reflect on is this, that in the first wave of the pandemic, if you were a Black African man, you were 3.7 times more likely to die. In the second wave, if you're a Bangladeshi man, then that risk of dying from this infection rises to five times. And you put those death rates next to the vaccine rates that Abdul has just shown us. And you can see the, just the anxiety. I was um, apologizing to Abdul two days ago for texting him at 10 past six in the morning or something like that, because this is the thing that is keeping me awake. You know, oftentimes they ask leaders, what is keeping you awake at night? The thing that is keeping me awake at night right now is that equitable access to this COVID vaccine? And not just the equitable access, but what else can we do? You know, what do we need to say? You tell us, and we will be doing our best to do it. We're on Twitter, we're on WhatsApp groups, we're on this call. You know, as many have said, everybody is going over and beyond the call of duty. It's because we care. There's nobody on this call who is being paid any more because they've decided to be on a call at half past eight in the evening. You've just seen Dr. Vanessa go on to yet another call. Goodness knows when that will end. We're here because we care. And I was late because I was recording yet another video to try and reach our communities. It's what we're here for. Whatever it takes, we will do. Just tell us, you know, in your own spheres of influence, what will work? What else haven't we thought about? Genuinely, this is our offer. And for those who are still hesitant, please don't take your guidance from WhatsApp and people who will hide, hide behind the wall of the screen and say all sorts of things that they don't bear the responsibility for the impact and the outcome of the things that they're saying. You know, the people that Jennifer is having to wrap up in ITU, losing a 20-year-old son, when actually we're not in the position we were in last year when, as I said before, we didn't have the vaccine. We all were helpless. That's not the situation now. We have this vaccine. You know, to step out of the front door of your house is a risk. There is absolutely no activity in life that is risk-free. None. Life is about a balance of risk. And we know on the balance of risk that these vaccines have saved thousands of lives. Absolutely hundreds of thousands of lives have been saved by these vaccines. We've all been able to resume some degree, some degree of normality. 
and I like what somebody said earlier on, nobody is going to intentionally cause harm. There's nothing to be gained by intentionally causing harm. And if you think about those mortality figures that I've just shared with you, and you look at communities that don't, that haven't experienced that level of mortality, the vaccine uptake rate is in the late 90%. If the vaccines were so dangerous, I would like to understand why the communities that have vaccine uptake rates of 96%, 97% in some cases, please tell me why haven't they dropped dead like flies? That's my question. You know, those communities that have come forward so strongly, taken the opportunity, had these vaccines, if all the dangers that people are bandying about were so, please explain why we haven't seen death rates to match 97% vaccine uptake in those communities. I want you to go away with those that question. And I'm just encouraging us again, please ask your questions. Nobody's saying don't ask questions, but ask the questions from the people who would be able to give you the data and the statistics that is based in the evidence not in the opinion of people who don't have the information to be voicing that opinion. We can't lose any more people from this community. It really is enough. Please come forward, take advantage of the offer. If you have questions, ask your questions in the places where you would get answers that are based in the scientific evidence. Let me just leave you with this final thought. The vaccines are safe, they are effective, they save lives, they save livelihoods. Yes, there are side effects. We would be, we would be unprofessional to say there are no side effects, but the balance of benefit versus risk is still in favor of you coming forward to have the vaccine. Thank you, Charles. Thank you very much, Dr. Bola, for those powerful words. So we will continue to encourage, if you have any further concerns after today, please feel free to drop us an email and we will arrange for you to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with our Black doctors. You know, they, they've offered and continue to offer their time and we are really, really grateful for that. Saturday morning, we have, you know, our last health hour for this year and and the focus is on the flu and asthma we're really grateful for you all giving your time because we've gone over but you're still on the call and want to work with you i'm going to give the final words to uh, faye before we leave Thanks, Charles. Sorry, I wasn't expecting that. No, absolutely fantastic. I was just putting my chat in the my, my message in the chat box just to say that it's been a really um, insightful um, presentation and conversation, and we'll just be taking on all on board all of the comments that you've made. Um, I've loved listening to the um, case, is the experiences from Elizabeth, memory, and others. You know, really powerful. And I just wonder, you know, how do we create some of those? innovative um, ways to engage our community because every day we're hearing about people that have sadly uh, lost their lives. So thank you to everybody for attending. Thank you, Dr. Bowler, for always speaking so powerfully and so passionately about this area of work. And also to uh, Dr. Ngozi, thank you to everybody for attending, contributing, and we'll write it up as we always do. And then we'll continue to communicate and liaise with you about how we can move forward and get more of our community vaccinated. So thank you again. Thank you everyone. Have a lovely evening and we will keep in touch. See you on Saturday morning. Thank you very much. Uh, this was wonderful. More please, Khan. More please. Thanks, Mandy, for all your support. Thanks Thank so you. much to Thanks, everyone. Khan.
<laughs> oh, thank, thank you, you very so much. much, Doctor. So you have been so insightful tonight and actually inspiring. And, you know, so much more confidence I have to, to be getting people to stand behind what I'm saying. And if I can get the Race Equality Panel to get behind this oh, as a volunteers group, because we represent all those communities, 